This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, host of Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking. Join the conversation every Tuesday at 11 as we dissect issues that are important to you and your family. That's Relatively Speaking, Tuesdays only on MPB Think Radio. This is Southern Remedy Kids and Teens on MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Morgan McLeod, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Internal Medicine at UMMC. Allergies are extremely common, and it is coming up on springtime, which is when there is a big flare-up of allergies. And so today, that's what we're going to be discussing. We're going to talk about allergies, um, both seasonal. We're going to talk some uh, food allergies, how you diagnose all of this, what are some good ways to treat it, and here to answer any questions that you may have. I have Dr. Charles Grogan on with us, who is an allergist and immunologist at UMMC, and he is going to be helping us with those discussions. So if you have any questions, comments, or you can send an email to kids at mpbonline.org. So good morning, Dr. Grogan. Thanks for coming on with us. Hey, Morgan. Thanks for having me on. Yes. Um, I said this last time you were on, but Dr. Grogan was one of my medical students when I was a <laughs> resident. So we go back way far oh, and yeah. um, he does a great job at UMC. Somebody was talking about you the other day and your grand rounds that you gave and just what a I good job it, you did. It. So um, it's fun having you on. So thanks for coming on. Um, let's talk about allergies because sure. I was just saying before we came <laughs> on that I'm all stuffy and I don't feel sick. So I don't think it's a cold necessarily, um, but I haven't seen any yellow or any pollen yet sure. but you were saying stuff is already flaring up it's so, already flaring yeah so it is here so tell us a little bit about one your training for an allergist and kind of how you came to that um, and what y'all do in the clinic so as a, uh, a chronic allergy sufferer myself <laughs> um, you know I was in the doctor's office as a kid all the time uh, I have asthma and I have some, some seasonal allergies as well and as I, uh, as I went through medical school, uh, one of the things that I really liked was kind of the basic science behind uh, immunology, um, which eventually led to me discovering allergy and immunology. And that's how I ended up where I am now. Um, but yeah, allergies are definitely in bloom now. Um, anytime you can see green outside, that means pollen's probably in there, uh, especially when it's green on the ground. If you see grass and you see weeds, um, you know, you're probably going to have some pollen, even if you don't see the yellow pollen in the air or on your car. Yeah. So why do some people react to allergies and some people don't? Because the people that don't have allergies are, are just I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and granted, mine aren't even that bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say I just am a mild allergy sufferer, thankfully. Um, but some people like don't have any reaction to it sure. at all. They can go sit out on the soccer fields with pollen flying everywhere and not even sneeze one time. So why is it that yours are so bad and, you know, somebody else doesn't have any allergies? You know, it's it's a great question, um, and we still don't know the full answer to it, but a, a kind of a simple way of looking at it is that our immune system is like a compass, and it likes to point in one direction. For most people, it likes to point towards the direction of fighting off things like viruses and bacteria. However, due to a variety of things like genetics or your environmental uh, exposures when you're a kid, it might point more towards the allergy side where you're having these uh, reactions to things that you normally should tolerate. It could also point over towards the auto-inflammatory side where you're having reactions against yourself and you can have things like rheumatologic disease. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this time of year is when we do get a lot of flare ups of allergies. Right. I feel like we mm -hmm. have two big seasons, like March, and then we always say like fair season. Mm -hmm. So like yeah, October. Mm -hmm. um, so like March, April, and then again, like October. So tell us a little bit about what is flaring people up right now right. in the springtime. Right. So in the springtime, we're going to really see a lot of weed and uh, grass pollen that are it's going crazy. So if you have a ragweed allergy, if you have uh, any issues with grasses, and especially southern grasses, things like Bahia, Bermuda, Johnson grass, and even some northern grasses that like to thrive down here, like Timothy, they're all in full bloom right now. Meanwhile, closer to fair season, like you said, in the fall, we're starting to see a lot more uh, tree pollen that's out in the air. And then, of course, year round, we're always going to struggle with, struggle with perennial allergens. Those are things that are um, always around us. So think of things like dust mite, cat, dog, or mold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about what we can do for allergies, because I know a lot of people out there listening are sufferers as well. Um, and so what are just some basic things to do? Because, you know, if 
this is starting up soccer season, baseball season, and before we even get into any medications and sure. things like that that we can take for it. What are just some things that you can do to protect yourself when you're out on the soccer yeah. <laughs> field with your kids on a Saturday morning or, um, you know, baseball games and all the different activities? Or maybe you don't even have to go to sports. Maybe you just like to be outside. Like my little girl would live outside. And so, therefore, I'm outside all the time. Sure. Um, and I don't – I'm not going to these sporting events. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we're just outside. So, what are some things that you can do to help with that? So the number one thing is always going to be avoidance, if possible. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we can't stop living our lives. We can't not go to these soccer games. Um, we can't not spend some time outside in this amazing weather. Um, but once you've already been outside, you've had all this pollen cover you. Uh, you might not even know that it's covering you. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing you want to do when you get back inside is not immediately go flop down on the bed and cover your sheets with the pollen. Um, you want to, you know, take your clothes off, throw them in the washer before you do anything else, change. Uh, maybe even consider taking a shower, especially if you're outside for a prolonged period of time doing something like, uh, like sports. Um, otherwise, that pollen is actually really sticky. Mm. It likes to stick around. And uh, if you sleep in it, that's going to be a lot worse than being outside in it for an hour. And then I read somewhere, too, about... Um taking your shoes off because that's oh, yeah. like a big, mm -hmm. and I'm terrible at that. I'm definitely not a no shoe household. <laughs> um, I don't know that I ever could break that habit because yeah. I hate walking around barefoot. It's just, I don't know what yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. I just don't like to walk around barefoot. Um, but anyway, that made so much sense to me when I, I didn't ever think about that, but yeah. you think about like how much your feet are stepping in that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then, then you're just bringing it into your house. So what happens is you actually track the pollen in on your shoes and it, will attach to different little dust particles and it'll aerosolize and go yeah. back up to the top of your head. Makes into, sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never thought about it that way. I just was thinking about it just yep. being <laughs> exposed on the, on the ground, but that's even worse. <laughs> you know, on the other hand, aside from pollens, things that perennial allergens, things like dust mites, cats, dogs, anything like that, um, you know, there are some basic things you can do to avoid things like that. You know, dust mites love humidity. And so they really, really like the South, especially Mississippi. <laughs> Um, so if you're using a humidifier, first off, I don't know how you're doing that. It's already humid enough down here, but if you actually use a dehumidifier and keep the humidity in your house below about 40%, um, that's still very comfortable for us to live in. And dust mites have a hard time living in that kind cool. of drier environment. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I have a question for Dr. Grogan. Yeah, sure. go ahead. Um, so my sister had allergies at a young age that she was constantly affected by, and it never bothered me. But as I got older, I started having allergic reactions. Can you develop allergies in your old age? Am I just getting more sensitive? And if I've developed an allergy now and I've never had to deal with it, who do I need to fight? Like, who do I need to yell at? <laughs> um, you know, so you absolutely can develop allergies as you get older. Um, usually out, we think of allergies more in kids because it's just a little bit more prevalent in kids. And then, you know, we quote unquote grow out of it as we get older, as our immune system kind of tends to right itself, but that doesn't always happen. And sometimes it can go the wrong way. Um, you know, one thing that we've kind of been, you know, thinking about is, is this really what causes allergies is the hygiene hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, it goes in and out of vogue um, for allergists over the last decade or so, but it's the idea that being exposed to things uh, from an early age actually helps develop your immune system on the right path. So if you're exposed to different bacteria by playing outside, um, your immune system has something to do. It's kind of like a di uh, idle hands devil's workshop thing. If your immune system doesn't have anything to do, um, it ends up pointing towards the wrong direction. You might start developing allergies. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I believe there has to be some truth to sure. that because, uh -huh. you know, we, you only see allergies in developed countries. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so like we don't have a lot of these problems in some of our third world countries. Mm -hmm. Granted, they have plenty of other problems. They're starting to catch up though. They're catching up. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't have the allergies yeah. mm -hmm. that we do, Correct. you know? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is because like they're in the dirt a lot more. They're mm -hmm. outside a Correct. lot more. Yep. They're not hypo, you know, like mm -hmm. watching their hands sure. furiously yeah. because they don't have the water supplies that we do and, and all the different things. They just have so many more exposures. So to me, there has to right. be some kind of truth to right. that because you just, you can't look at, you know, the U S versus some of the countries mm -hmm. in Africa and Asia who don't have these problems and see that there mm -hmm. has to be some kind of difference there. The one thing I do want to qualify on the hygiene hypothesis is sometimes it can be used as a way to say, well, 
then should we get vaccines? What we really think about the hygiene hypothesis is that it's about bacterial exposure, not viral exposure. And so by vaccinating at a young age, which are primar primarily aimed at viral infections, um, you know, there, there shouldn't be any kind of uh, push in your immune system towards allergies by yeah. doing that. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, we are going to take our first break and then we are going to talk about how to treat said allergies because I'm sure a lot of people have those. So um, we will take our first break and then we'll talk about some different medicines that you can get over the counter and then maybe some different prescription medicines and even allergy shots because everybody always has questions about that. Or you can always send us an email as well to kids at mpbonline.org. This is Southern Remedy Kids and Teens on MPB Think Radio. We are talking today with Dr. Grogan, who is an allergist at UMMC, and he is answering any of our allergy questions. So share some questions or maybe some things that you have been you have found to be helpful for your allergies, or you can send us an email to kids at mpbonline.org. All right, so before the break, we talked a lot about just allergies in general and, um, you know, why some people get them and some people don't. We don't really completely understand, um, but essentially when you're having allergies, your body is reacting to something um, that most people tolerate, but some people just, their bodies kind of go a little haywire when they're exposed to it. And so I guess a lot of our treatments are based off of some of the different things involved in those reactions. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's how we kind of pick what we, what therapies we feel like would be helpful. For right. example, antihistamines. Mm -hmm. I feel like everybody has, kn has heard the term antihistamine before and probably has taken at least a Benadryl at some point sure. in their life, you know? Um, and so explain to us about antihistamines. Cause I feel like that's kind of one of the first lines that a lot of people grab when mm -hmm. they go to the, um, to the store, um, and why they can be helpful with allergies. Sure. So one of the big issues with allergies is histamine, and which is why we take antihistamines. Um, histamine is typically released by something called mast cells. They're parts of our immune system. They live in our skin. They live in our gut. They're in our nose also. Um, and histamine is the itch and swell chemical that gets, uh, that gets released um, when we have an allergic reaction. And so by blocking the effects of histamine, we hopefully can block some of the things like nasal congestion or runny nose, things like that. Um, we have several different types of antihistamines over the counter now. Um, you know, we're all familiar with things like Zyrtec or Allegra or even something like Benadryl, which is what we call first generation antihistamine, which is why it makes us so sleepy. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as of I think last year, azelastine or the uh, brand name is Astelin, uh, went from a prescription medicine. And this is a another type of antihistamine, a nasal spray. It went from being a prescription to an over the counter medicine. And so now we have that as an option, too. Mm -hmm. And I've never tried it, but um, my mother-in-law last year, I remember, was like, have you ever heard of this stuff? Yeah. This stuff is amazing because, bless her heart, they grew. she grew up in Indiana, and mm -hmm. now she lives here in Mississippi, and she, it's a whole new struggle for her because sure. of all her new allergies. Um, but, yeah, so I did not, at that time, mm -hmm. I did not realize it had gone generic, like, or not, mm -hmm. I guess, generic, but over the counter. Right. Um, and I always um, usually advise patients to go for a topical medicine rather than a pill, if at all possible for their allergies. They tend to work much better, mm -hmm. um, both for al allergic nose symptoms and for allergic eye symptoms. It's all right there together. Which the allergy eye drops are over the counter now, they too. Also are That's as been well. for a few mm -hmm. years. But um, Patidae, I think, Pataday. is the. Mm -hmm. Or Pata Olipatidine is the yeah. generic. For Olipatidine, that. yeah. Patanol was our brand name that right. we had to prescribe, but Patidae is what it goes by over Correct. the counter. Right, right, right. But yeah, so essentially you have antihistamines that you can take as by mouth, um, which are like your Zyrtec, Allegra, mm -hmm. Zazol, right. all those medicines. And then you have nasal sprays, which is the um, Astelin. And then you have the eye drops, which is the Patidae right. too. And I, so. And another medicine we have are a steroid nasal spray. You know, we, we think of steroids, we think of, oh man, it's going to cause weight gain, it's going to cause, you know, blood sugar issues. But this dose is so small, there's no way it could cause any of that. It's one of the safest medicines you could probably take. Um, Flonase or Fluticasone is the name of this. I um, mean, it's actually probably one of the strongest medicines we have for allergies. The problem is, is you have to take it every day <laughs> for weeks before you start seeing a benefit. It's almost more like a blood pressure medicine mm -hmm. than, uh, you know, a relief medicine. Yeah. And I always tell people, too, with the steroids, uh, the Flonase is because they're a little scared of it. But it's very local. You know, very local. you're mm -hmm. putting it in your nose and it's not 
being really absorbed into your blood. Right. The reason it works so well is because it does work locally. Mm -hmm. It works right there in your sinus, you know, nasal cavities and all of that. So right. it's not getting absorbed into your blood. So you really don't have, especially like my diabetic patients are always scared to use sure. it. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's right there in the nose. So it's not going anywhere. Correct. So, um, and like you, you mentioned Flonase takes a few days, uh, a few weeks to take effect. Right. Um, and that's really hard to for people when you're suffering. <laughs> um, but if you stick with it, it really does make a difference. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. can you speaking of nose sprays? So we're talking about um, flow nays in particular. Can sure. you tell people how to use it? Because I feel like most people don't know. And I know that sounds crazy, but a lot of people don't know how they're supposed to use these nose sprays. Sure. Is I there would, a particular way you counsel your patients on using those? I would even say that nine out of ten people probably don't use their nose sprays correctly. Um, when you use a nose spray, most people want to aim up and then actually point a little bit in to follow the natural curvature of their nose. But the way you want to use a nose spray is you actually want to point straight up and then aim a little bit out towards your ears um, and then kind of, you know, sniff just gently as you use the nasal spray. Yeah, You don't um, have to take a big like breath in no, or anything like, like that. that. It's just a nothing little bitty like sniff. Uh huh. Yep. Um, and then, you know, if you're doing Astelin, you're going to do one spray twice a day. If you're going to do Flonase, you could do either one spray twice a day or two sprays at once. But if you're going to do two sprays at once, you want to separate it by at least a minute. You give some time for there to be some uh, uh, movement of that liquid before you spray it again. And then the biggest complaint I get about people with nose sprays is the taste that they get in their mouth sure. after it. Um, is there any way to avoid that? <laughs> so using the, the nose spray correctly is going, yeah. is going to help a lot. Um, if you point inwards, um, you're going to just hit that uh, nasal septum. Um, and uh, if you do that, it's going to just immediately drain down the back of your throat. But if you point outwards a little bit, it's going to get where it needs to go and even go a little bit towards your sinuses. Um, and by doing that, you're going to avoid that nasty taste. Yeah. Now, for some of them, like azelastine, the antihistamine nasal spray, you're probably still going to have a bit of a bad taste with it. But I think that it helps enough to, to justify the use. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to go try some because <laughs> I like I I mean, like I said, my allergies are usually pretty mild. But mm -hmm. the fact that they have already started right now and it's only March yeah. 7th um, makes me a little nervous. So well, I should probably go make an investment in these. In <laughs> the, the good news, the good news about the antihistamine nasal sprays is that they work in about 10 minutes. Um, so it's very fast relief as compared to doing some looking like a a steroid nasal spray. Yeah. All right. If you have any questions or comments, give us a call. 1-877-MPB-RING. 1-877-672-7464. Okay. So while we're on the subject of nose sprays and runny nose, Afrin. Yes. Everybody likes Afrin. Yes. I'm guilty myself of using <laughs> Afrin before bed at times. Um, so tell us a little bit about Afrin and is it indicated for a nose spray for allergies? Sure. So, or just runny nose in general, I yeah. guess. So Afrin is a nasal decongestant. Um, Oxymetolazine is the generic name for it. Um, you, it's, it's a very popular medicine. Um, Afrin is really popular because within just a few minutes of using it, you can breathe. Mm -hmm. And so for some people, you can. it's the best you've ever, ever breathed. <laughs> Especially when you're going to bed at night. Yes. That's the only time I ever use it is when I'm going to bed. You're right. Um, the problem with Afrin is that if you continue to use it over several days, you develop, an, uh, you develop the risk of having rebound congestion, which means that you use the Afrin, you use the Afrin, and then the next time you don't use the Afrin, you're actually more congested than if you hadn't in the first place. Um, I think my current record, uh, for a patient who was using Afrin, they were going through a bottle a day. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's very serious. It's, it's, it becomes very difficult to get those patients mm -hmm. off of Afrin. You know, you have to put them on a long course of oral steroids. It, it's very difficult. Um, but if you use it as needed, uh, and for no longer than three days at a time, you shouldn't develop that, uh, rebound congestion. What we typically like to tell our patients is that if you're going to ever use Afrin, you should combine it with some Flonase, or again, the generic for that is Flutigazone. Um, that nasal steroid will actually help mediate some of the rebound uh, congestion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so as long as you use it in short spurts, right. no more than three days, Correct. it is okay. Yes. So. Um, and we like to combine Afrin with the nasal rinse. Mm -hmm. You know, some people like the neti pots, you know, be very sterile if you're going to do that. Or you can get like something like a Neil Med bottle from, you know, Kroger or from Walmart. Um, those nasal rinses are going to work a lot better if you've uh, used a nasal decongestant prior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the saline rinses and things yes. like that, yeah. um, 
Oh, I can't tolerate them. I can't do it. I mean, I wish I could because I know how beneficial they can they be. They can be very good. Um, but yeah, that you bring up a good point because I think a lot of people don't remember that part sometimes that you have to make sure you're using some kind of sterile water. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't want to use tap water if you no, are going to no, do any yeah. kind of nasal rinses. Yeah. So, Okay. I think we have a caller. Hey, Virginia, how are you? Good. Ophthalmologist told me that I couldn't use nasal steroids because of the increase in the pressure in the eye. Yeah, you know, we get that question relatively often. Um, I think the jury is still kind of out on whether or not, um, you know, things like glaucoma are an absolute contraindication to using nasal steroids. Um, there have been plenty of studies that said it looks very safe, and there are some studies that say, well, maybe it, maybe it isn't so safe. Um, and so I would think that most eye doctors are erring on the side of caution and saying, let's hold off on doing intranasal steroids. Um, we have some patients with a lot of swelling in their nose, things like what we call like nasal polyps. And for those patients, you know, if they have glaucoma, we'll go ahead and push forward and, and use nasal steroids. But just to play it absolutely safe, we usually try to avoid using them in that situation. Thank you. Thank absolutely. You. Yeah, thanks Virginia for calling and sharing that because you bring up a good point. Yeah, we mm -hmm. do we do see that a fair amount. And I remember um Dr. Watkins coming and giving us a lecture about that as a resident and how you do have to be careful. But like you right. said, in certain patients yeah. they, they will oblige a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but just in general, if you just have mild symptoms, it's best to avoid Correct. medicines like Flonase um, if you are at risk for glaucoma, right. if they've told you that you have some some higher pressure. So, so thanks for calling and sharing that, Virginia, because you brought up a great point. We appreciate it. Um, we have another caller. We have Mary in Clinton. Good morning, Mary. What's going on? Hi. Um, I have allergy problems that just like everybody, I guess. <laughs> but I have a friend that uses the the bottle with the saline mist to, to clean her sinuses. Sure. And she has this drop of the no tear baby shampoo and says that it's more effective that way. I was wondering if that should make a difference or if that's just in her mind or it's a possibility that it helps. Huh. You know, that would be a new one for me. I don't think I've, I've heard of somebody using something like that. Um, you know, some a lot of the nasal saline sprays now do include some other kind of ingredient um, to help, uh, you know, either clean things out or to prevent infections. Um, while I'm not familiar with using, you know, like a no tear shampoo in the, in the drops, there is a nasal saline spray called clear and it's spelled X L E A R. And it contains in it a type of sugar called xylitol. And it'll actually coat your sinuses and your nose and help prevent infections. Hmm. Um, and so that's actually the nasal spray that I use. Um, uh, for whenever I feel like I've got a lot of stuff going on. And I know... Oh, and can you spell that again? Clear, X-L-E-A-R. And you can get that over the counter at, you know, Walgreens, CVS, anything like that. And I've Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for your call. I've seen um, ENT also put like some antibiotic ointment in their they rinses mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. If you, especially if you get frequent infections mm -hmm. with it, they'll yep. tell people to put a little Bacterban or Mepuricin, right. which is a prescription antibiotic ointment, but mm -hmm. you can mix it with some of your, your rinses too. Correct. I've seen mm -hmm. them do that before. And they'll also mix some steroids in there from time to time, but it, depending on the severity of the, the swelling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks Mary for your call. We appreciate it. Thank you. Y'all have a great day. Thanks. Bye. You too. This is Southern Remedy Kids and Teens on MPB Think Radio. We are talking today with Dr. Grogan, who is an allergist at UMMC, and he is here, here to answer any of your questions. So we did have a bunch of people call in all at the same time. And so I don't know, I think Charles probably got a little overwhelmed back there. So <laughs> if we couldn't get to your call, y'all give us a call back. I think we just had like four or five calls right at once. So we couldn't answer all of them at the same time. So um, if we missed you, give us a call back. All right, let's go to callers. We've got John. Good morning, John. What's going on? Hello. Hey. Oh, this is Jordan. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Jordan. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> so, um, I have breakouts um, as far as like when I'm getting hot or flustered, I break out into highs. Um, I take like a Benadryl sometimes or sometimes I wait until I cool off and then they go away. Um, but I also have two sons, and I'm just trying to see if this is something that they may possibly develop. I've been doing this for over a course of years yeah. now. 
Yeah. So we see this all the time. Um, you know, our, we have patients lining up the, the halls uh, for these chronic hives. Um, and, and that's actually the term for it. We call it chronic idiopathic urticaria. Um, and what, that's just a fancy doctor way of saying it's chronic. It's lasted longer than six weeks. Idiopathic means we don't know why it happens. And urticaria just means hives. Um, again, very common. Um, we don't really have any idea why this is happening. You know, we can do a million dollar workup looking at foods and aero allergens. Almost, you know, we'll almost never find out why it's happening. Um, but for the most part, this is usually a self-limiting disease process. It lasts between three to five years, typically. Um, and about 50% of the time, it unfortunately will be accompanied by some facial swelling. Do you have like eye puffiness or lip swelling when it happens? Yes. So, um, I one time had angioedema. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, um, very common. That happened. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, I've been to a bunch of doctors and basically nothing <laughs> yeah and you know that that's the hard part for a lot of patients is they're you know they're, they're clawing their hair out trying to figure out what's causing these reactions when it's more of what we call an immunologic process than an allergic process um and usually it's pretty easy for us to um control these knock them down to zero symptoms by using um antihistamines um we'll use prescription doses of antihistamines um well above what you would normally take just over the counter um, and if things get very severe and we have a hard time controlling it, we'll actually use injectable medicines, um, bi biologics, like one would be called Zolaire. Some that target your immune, system. your immune system mm -hmm. so that hopefully you can prevent that over, over activity Correct. of the, of the immune system. Okay. And so do I need to be worried about my children? From what I understand, yeah. from what I understand, there's not a clear genetic link for this from, you know, mother to, to child. Um, but if you do have a lot of, you know, immunologic problems, there could be some, uh, maybe not, again, not direct hereditary causes, but just some, um, genetic factors that could be passed down. Okay. Yeah. Alrighty. Yeah. Well, thanks oh. for your call, Jordan. I know that can be frustrating. I have several patients who suffer with that too. So, um, but hopefully maybe they can find you the right medicine and kind of calm it down. And I pray your sons will not get this yeah, either. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thank you all so very much. Yeah, thank you for your call. And um, we'll go next to John. Oh, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Absolutely. What's going on today? Well, I have sleep apnea, and um, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Oh, yeah. And I use a CPAP, and at night my nose gets stuffy sometimes, and I do use the Flonase, which seems to help. Mm -hmm. And I also use a, a Breathe Right nasal strip, which seems to help. Mm -hmm. But my question was, I've heard of two procedures that improve airflow. One's called a Vivaer, V-I-V-A-E-R, okay. where they reshape the nasal valve and also turbinate reduction surgery. Sure. And I wanted mm -hmm. to see if you could comment on those those two procedures. Sure. And see if those sure. So, you know, um, the, the nasal valve is the smallest point in your airway uh, from, you know, from nose right until you get to the very spot bottom part of your lungs that's the most narrow part of your airway so that's going to um really control a lot of your nasal uh, airflow um you know obviously this is going to be a question more for an ear nose and throat surgeon to determine you know is your nasal valve a little too small is it getting blocked is that the reason why you're having a bunch of congestion or if you're having turbinate issues you know that would definitely be an another possible problem Turbinate uh, hypertrophy, which is the fancy doctor way of saying it's, it's too big, um, can occur due to allergies. And so Flonase will definitely help with that. And it can help with turbinates that are too big for any cause. Um, but if you get a tighter control of any possible allergies, then, you know, hopefully you might be able to shrink those turbinates without even using surgery. But if you're going to determine between either of those procedures, you definitely would want to consult with an ear, nose and throat surgeon first because they would need to be able to look in your nose and make the decision of which one is the biggest cause of your congestion. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Are there any side effects from those two uh, procedures or are they pretty safe? Well, I, think, I mean, as far as I know, they're pretty safe. Yeah. I they're, actually had a patient in just yesterday who had just had one done yeah. um, for similar symptoms. And, and she act, she had to have the procedure done twice. Mm -hmm. um, but after the second time, she said it it's slowly starting to get better. She found it to be pretty successful. Yeah, the, I think both of them are considered very uh, straightforward procedures for the ear, nose, and throat doctors. Um, 
And I mean, obviously all surgeries carry some sort of risk, mm -hmm. but I, th I think as far as an elective surgery, it would be one of the safer ones. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for your call. Man, I hear about that all the time from a CPAP yeah, causing all the lots time. of congestion. Mm -hmm. So, so you are not alone. No, nope, you're not. And there's not an easy answer for it either, mm -mm. unfortunately. Mm -mm. All right, we'll go next to Dave. Good morning, Dave. What's good going morning. on? Hey. Good morning. I want to know what kind of good maiden spray I can use. The kind I've been using, it was good for about time I have been stop up real bad. What kind of nasal spray are you currently using? Over the counter, I've got the name, man. But uh, it do good for about eight hours. Then when that eight hour up, it stop up bad. My nose just clogs. Do you think it's afrin or oxymetolazine? Does that ring a bell? I think it's oxycodone. It sounds like you're using a decongestant medicine like afrin or oxymetolazine. And those work really well for a while. And then you're right, about six hours later, they start. you start getting really congested again. Yeah, that's yeah. what's going on. What I would recommend to you is I would try to hold off on using that nasal spray. And what's going to happen is, is the next two or three days are not going to be very pleasant. You're going to be a lot more congested than usual. But if you switch over to a nasal uh, to a nasal steroid spray like Flonase, um, you might see that you're going to have a little bit of shrinkage of the, those turbinates like our previous caller was just talking about. And you'll breathe a little bit better. And then as time goes on, you'll breathe a lot better. What kind of I need? I would use something called fluticasone or Flonase. Okay. A nasal steroid. And just know that it doesn't work right away like the Afrin does. The Afrin works really quickly, but the Flonase... Takes several weeks. Yeah, you got to do it pretty consistently every day for a couple of weeks to see the full effects of it. Okay, then. Thank you. That's what I wanted to Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dave, for your call. Um, I just wanted to talk about allergy shots because sure. I feel like everybody always has questions about mm -hmm. when do I know if I need allergy shots sure. or when mm -hmm. do I know if my kid needs to go see an allergist and consider getting allergy mm -hmm. shots. So what would you tell people regarding that? So the first thing I would say is that if you think you need allergy shots, um, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> um, allergy, there's no you know distinct cutoff of I'm taking this many medicines or my symptoms are this severe. The indication for allergy shots is I have allergies. We found out what they were by allergy testing and I'm kind of sick of taking medicines. I want to do something a little bit more permanent. Um, allergy shots are more of a cure instead of a treatment. We usually we see a cure rate of somewhere between 90 to 95% for our younger crowd and about 85 to 90% in our adults. Mm -hmm. Um, and it can not only help with allergic nose and eye symptoms, but it can also help with things like asthma or eczema if there is an allergic component there. Um, it's a time investment, allergy shots are. You know, we, we do weekly shots for several months and then eventually we move up to monthly shots for several years. But again, we're doing this as more of a cure rather than just a treatment. Yeah. And so the reason you have to do so many shots is because you just slowly have to expose the body to it. You can't just be like, <laughs> right. throw it all in there right. at once. So yeah. it, it is a process. Yeah. So. Putting something in your body that we know you're allergic to is always a bit of a, yeah. a hairy process. But by going very slow and safe, um, you know, this, this is a relatively safe procedure. So who would you recommend getting allergy tested in? You know, like... Who are the ones that do you recommend going to see the allergist and getting sure. allergy testing in? Because, you know, it's a pretty not comfortable thing to yeah. do if you do the the skin, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. test, which is going to be probably one of the more accurate ones. Sure. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Like who needs to actually go get allergy testing? So if I would say that if you're using multiple medications to control your allergies and you're still not satisfied with the control, that's when I would go ahead and, and look, look into an allergist. I would also really think about it if you have allergic symptoms as well as asthma and eczema, since you can see some benefit from, uh, from allergy shots in those, in those conditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's the big triad of right, yeah. allergies, mm -hmm. eczema, and, and asthma. They all kind of go hand in hand. This is Southern Remedy Kids and Teens on MPB Think Radio. We have some time left, so y'all give us a call and ask Dr. Grogan your allergy questions. All right. We've got another caller, Gerald. Good morning, Gerald. What's going on? Okay. So um, I do have some allergies, but um, at the same time, I also use a CPAP machine uh, because of sleep apnea. Uh, and uh, so what my question was is that 
Um, I uh, sometimes not necessarily congested a lot, even though I am, you know, when I first wake up. But I, I'm finding myself like kind of breathing hard during the what times that I'm stressed or times that I'm uh, under activity. Or um, and I was just wondering if that is a uh, also a common symptom or something you hear from people who use the CPAP machine. Not necessarily. I would say, so you said you get short of breath when you're under stress or with activity. Is that what you said? You kind of cut out a little Mm -hmm. bit. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's right. So I have a couple, I mean, I have several different thoughts going through my head as an internal medicine doctor, but first question would be, are you a smoker or were you a smoker? Um, because, no. okay, good. So COPD is less likely, um, because that would be one of the first things. The other thing would be the heart. Um, you know, because we know, number one, having sleep apnea puts pressure on your heart and stress on your heart. So if you were undiagnosed for a while, that probably did stress your heart a little bit. Um, Number two, if you have high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol problems, anything like that, you know, you're getting at high risk for having heart problems. And some people don't have chest pain. They just have shortness of breath with working Mm -hmm. out and stress. Um, and so it may be, you know, you want to consider getting your heart tested. Um, and then if all of that comes back normal too, then we can think about the lungs. Um, and I would recommend getting some pulmonary function tests that can tell us a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what that does is they watch your lungs when you breathe in and you breathe out and it can tell us if you're having more, um, what kind of problems you're having. Now, some people with sleep apnea have some associated lung disease too. And so it could be something like that. Um, adults get asthma. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, we see that a decent amount, not a lot, but a decent enough amount that it's possible. Um, and then lastly would be, you know, some kind of other lung process going on in your lungs, some kind of lung disease. So I don't, I would not necessarily blame it on your sleep apnea or congestion with those symptoms that you're having. I would first yeah. and foremost, make sure your heart's okay. Yep. I don't know how old you are, Gerald, but how old are you? Uh, 55. Yeah, so you're you're getting to that age where we definitely start worrying about your heart. Yep. Um, so first and foremost, I would say that, um, especially if you have high blood pressure, diabetes, anything like that. And then the next step would be um, considering those lung function tests. Because like I said, some of the, the lung processes can go hand in hand with sleep apnea. So I wouldn't directly relate it to the sleep apnea or congestion. Okay. Okay, that helps. Yeah, I do have, you know, uh, right, uh, a small amount. I'd say slight high blood pressure, only take like a half a five milligram no pill, but I do have hypertension, you know, small amounts. Yeah, so you yeah, you probably need to go get it checked and you would be surprised. Like I've I've had a patient before who was who was a runner and really didn't have many problems, but was telling me that they were getting more short of breath with their exercise and running and sure enough ended up with some stents. So, you know, like it it can happen to anybody and mm-hmm. he never had the chest pain, just noticed that his stamina wasn't as good as it used to be. So um, so you may want to just go talk to your doctor about that and make sure that there's nothing going on with your heart or your lungs. Okay, so go to uh, like a primary care physician? Or yeah. Make uh, yeah. like an appointment with a cardiologist. I think just internal medicine or family medicine should be fine. Mm-hmm. We can, as those providers, we can order um, we can order stress tests and things like that if we need to. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Thanks so much for your call. It's good talking to you. Um, we have Maurice who is from Memphis. Good morning, Maurice. What's going on? Good morning. Yes. Um, I have um, sinus season that started, hay fever season that started for me already, and I was wondering if the um, sinus cocktail shots are, are good for you. A sinus cocktail shot? Yes. Is, uh, I don't it's know if that... Hay fever. Is that a, like a, an antibiotic and a steroid shot? I'm not exactly sure what's in it. I, I sure. uh, had them in the past, and, and and they seem to work back in some years ago, but I haven't had one in a while because I've been using the uh, Claritin D. Sure, actually. sure. Is, is this, so, is this but, something that you get, like, at a doctor's office, at, like, an urgent care clinic? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah. usually the, yeah. the cocktail shot that we like to call it is, is, is a combination of um, a type of antibiotic and a steroid. So we, we try not to do those. 
um, because for the most part, most sinus problems are viral rather than uh, bacterial. Now, if it's going on for a long time, you have fevers, then definitely could have a bacterial component to it. Um, but especially the steroids, um, you know, most people don't need a systemic steroid, you know, either a pill or a shot for their sinuses. Um, we kind of talked a little bit already during the show about using something topical rather than systemic. Um, and the reason why is because systemic steroids are kind of tough on your body. And the more we learn about them, the more we realize that you actually kind of build up a steroid debt over your life. Um, that just because if you get a steroid shot when you're five years old, if you get it when you're 15 years old, if you get it when you're 35 years old, those add up as, as, as you, as you get older. Um, and it can lead to, you know, issues with, um, blood sugar, with your bone health, all kinds of things. And so using something a little bit more mild, like a steroid, uh, nasal rinse or a nasal spray is usually a lot just as effective. Um, but without all the negative side effects. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh can I follow that up with a question sure. about the, the proticotone? So I've used the proticotone, but I, I just heard you guys explain why it doesn't work as well as I expect. I right. heard other people have good results with it, but I didn't realize you have to take it that long before you get good results. Like right. So Most I, people I, give up on I've it. Used Claritin. <laughs> yeah, I, give Clar I use Claritin D. Yes. And the regular Claritin doesn't seem to work. I, I have to take the, the D, and uh -huh. the generic version usually doesn't work as well as this. So, um, I'm wondering, is there uh, is there an alternative to the Claritin D to over the counter? Um, so whenever you see a, a D in a, um, in a with an antihistamine, it's going to contain uh, contain a decongestant. Um, so usually you either have Sudafed or pseudoephedrine. Um, now I do want to make a, a kind of a point here that there's been a lot of evidence that's come out over the last few years that shows that pseudoephedrine doesn't actually work that well. Um, it really just raises your blood pressure and speeds up your heart rate without really doing anything to decongest you. Now, Sudafed, which is now over the counter as of, I think, two or three years ago, yeah. um, does do you, does decongest you. Um, you should be a little, I wouldn't say wary, but thoughtful about using a, an oral decongestant uh, because it can raise your blood pressure. It can cause your heart to be a little bit faster. And if you have anything like heart problems or high blood pressure, I would tend to try to avoid those if at all possible. Um, my alternative to Zyrtec D would be using an antihistamine nasal spray since they works a lot faster and it's more effective. Okay. Yeah. All and, right. Yeah. Thank you for your call. I usually tell my patients, um, <laughs> no more than three days. Like if you're having yeah. really bad symptoms and yeah. you have high blood pressure or heart problems or things like that, you know, you can take the Sudafed or the mm -hmm. D part yeah. of the Claritin D or Zyrtec D, Allegra D, whatever, which is your choice. Um, but just no more than three days. Right. And I think that's, um, that's, that's very fair, you know, mm -hmm. because yeah. it's fine to take in a little bit and, mm -hmm. I don't really know where three days came from, but you know, that's just kind of our rule of thumb through four days. Sure. Just don't take anything more than that. And usually, usually you're fine. Yeah. So, um, hopefully that was helpful for Maurice. Um, thank you all everybody for your calls and we are running out of time and thank you, Dr. Grogan for Absolutely. coming in. This hour passed by really fast. <laughs> um, and thanks everybody for your calls. Hopefully that was helpful. We're going to have to get you back on because we didn't get to even talk about food allergies. Uh, another time. Yes. So we're going to bring him back on and we're going to talk about food allergies, but thank you again for sharing your time with us. We appreciate it. Absolutely. If there was something that we missed or you have any questions, you can always email us, kids at MPB online, and we will try, um, online.org. Sorry, I forgot that part. <laughs> kids at MPB online.org. Um, and we will get back to you with those answers. So we appreciate you coming on again. This has been Southern Remedy Kids and Teens. It's a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, and it's funded in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center and generous supports from listeners like you. Um, our show was engineered by Lacey, and I think Charles was our call screener. I'm Dr. Morgan McLeod. Join us next Thursday at 11 for Southern Remedy Kids and Teens. And take, stay tuned for NPR's Here and Now coming up next on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone.